Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Senior Lecturer in Elite Performance at the University of Central Lancaster, John Kiley. So this episode of the Pasty Performance Podcast is sponsored by Vald Performance, creators of the Nordboard. So if you haven't heard of the Nordboard already, don't worry, I'll explain, it's really, really simple. The Nordboard is a really fast and accurate system for monitoring hamstring strength. So as practitioners, we can do very little about athlete age and previous hamstring injury, but what we can do something about is our athlete's eccentric strength. And that's where the Nordboard fits in really nicely. It isn't going to get your athlete's hamstrings bulletproof, but what it is going to do is give you the right information so you can make the right decisions at the right time. If you do want any more information, you can go over to Vald Performance, that's V-A-L-D performance.com, or email info at valdperformance.com. Thanks for tuning in to episode 69 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So I'm going to keep this intro nice and short and just say it's a fantastic episode with John talking periodization, uh, monitoring and coordination and a little bit about Franz Bosch's work, uh, which is uh, creating a bit of a stir on, on social media lately. So just before we get into the chat with John, I uh, just want to draw your attention to a webinar. So it's number three of the Pacey Performance webinar series and it's with Matt Jordan, who did a podcast uh mid last year which was very very well received uh, people loved it i know matt's a, a genius i've seen him uh, present out in seattle and it was absolutely excellent so it was no brainer for me to get him on the webinar uh, and the webinar series for number three so if you are interested it's on sunday the 21st of february at 7 p.m uh, gmt so that'll allow uh, all the us and canadian guys to get involved in the sunday afternoon rather than the first two which were uh, Australian based and pretty middle of the night over there. So if you are interested, get to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Matt. Click on the on the button where it says click to book, obviously, and um, and get registered. It'll be, it'll be a great event with Matt, really looking forward to it. Um, if you can't make it on the day uh, at the time, you will get a live record, a, a recording of the live event. Uh, for, which will give you access to the to the presentation for seven days uh, post the 21st of February. So that's that, and I will leave you with episode 69 with John Kiley. Uh, enjoy and let me know what you think. Okay, hi guys, thanks for tuning into the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today we have John Kiley, who is the Senior Lecturer in Elite Performance at the Institute of Coaching Performance at UCLan. So I really wanted to get John on um, because of his his views on, on periodization and a few other things. So first of all, first of all, uh, welcome to the podcast, John. Great, thanks Rob, happy to be here. Pleasure. So... Do you just want to give the listeners a little bit of an information on um, on your background, your education, what you're currently doing? I uh, yeah, I guess I I started off as a hard working but painfully limited competitor. <clears throat> uh, I was into combat sports. I was national champion, international champion kickboxer, and uh, switched to boxing in my kind of mid twenties and won a couple of national titles and boxed on the international circuit for a few years, uh, which was great experience, but wasn't much fun. If you're going to be an international boxer, you're better off being a really good one rather than just an average one. Um, uh, I was coaching young, maybe 21, 22, uh, and kind of did it a bit back to front. I, I hadn't really any educational background just really a practitioner uh maybe my mid 20s 26 or so i i decided to try my hand at sports science so applied to a university as a mature student got in there uh i studied sports science so that was my introduction to kind of the more academic world um came out of that and i was lucky enough to get straight 
to a job with uh, uh, the what was at the time called the National Coaching and Training Centre in Ireland. It's since the name has since changed, but basically it was the institution that looked after uh, international and funded athletes. Uh, and so it was a really good education. Got to work with a lot of athletes in a lot of different roles as physiologists, as a prescriber of training, as S and C. Yeah, so all, all kinds of everything. Uh, long story short, I guess uh, uh, after a couple of years, I decided I need to upskill myself a little bit. So I went and I did a master's in strength conditioning in Edinburgh, uh, moved back home, started working for myself. Uh, I was the SNC for the Paralympic Council of Ireland, the Athletics Association of Ireland, the Rowing Association, and a few other bits and bobs like that, did a few teams. Uh, did some coaching, coached a Paralympic medalist in Athens. Uh, then around 2005, I uh, I moved over to the UK to take up a role as the head of SNC for UK Athletics. Uh, did that for an Olympic cycle. After the Olympic cycle, as is typical in professional sports, there's big upheaval. Uh, there's a big call. I survived the call, was moved sideways. Uh, and stayed there for another couple of years. And um, in 2011, I moved to University of Central Lancashire, stayed on doing some practical work with a couple of elite athletes who were leading into 2012, and uh, moved back to Ireland and do quite a lot of my work from a back kitchen in a small village rural Ireland uh, on Skype. And then uh, every now and again, I pop over to the UK and uh, have some meetings in that. Uh, maybe the last thing of, of interest is uh, over the past few years, I've worked with I've worked with a number of world champions, uh, Olympic medalist in track and field, in Paralympics, a couple in in other individual sports. And um, for the past two seasons, three, two Six Nations, I've worked with uh, the Irish rugby team, um, and I contracted full time to them for the World Cup. So in that role, uh, I was. I worked under the, their head of strength and conditioning, Jason Cowman, and was mostly concerned with working with people who were on the way back from injury or had previous convoluted histories of injury. So, so yeah, so kind of a, a mixed bag, but uh, a long road. And um, yeah, has me where I am now, my fancy job title in uh, <laughs> University of Central Lancashire. So you were with uh, Derek, Derek Evely at UK Athletics? Uh, yeah, so I think our time overlapped for a couple of years. Uh, now we tended we worked in different centres, so we uh, we didn't overlap too often. But uh, yeah, we certainly uh, we, I would certainly have known Derek and uh, have interacted with him a fair bit in my time there. Mm -hmm. So how so how did you get involved? I mean, we've never had any anyone who's kind of worked a lot with Paralympic athletes. How did you get into working in Paralympic athletes? Was it just uh, kind of fell into the fall into that kind of subsection of of athletes or what? Well, it was really, really interesting for me. And I guess one of the advantages of uh, being in Ireland is a small country. The institute that provided service wasn't as well evolved as, as it is now. So once I was in the door there, you were basically working with lots and lots of different people doing lots of different roles. Uh, and nearly by default, I ended up coaching a cerebral palsy runner. Um, and we we had a bit of success culminating in a, a world title in 2005 and a, and a Paralympic medal. And with the years working with him, I started working with more and more Paralympic athletes and more and more started coming and just asking for help with their gym programs or, or training programs. But I have to say it was, it was probably one of the most... Uh, the best de personal development experiences from a perspective of the level of individual problems and individual individualization that had to go into the exercises was, uh, it certainly made you think outside of the conventional S and C box. Uh, so I spent a lot of time there causing exercises to the athletes. Now, I think it's obvious we do it with Paralympic athletes. If I'm missing an arm, well, there's no point telling me to do a bench press. We need to come up with something else. But I guess, you know, the more I worked 
with able-bodied and uh, par Paralympians, after a while I got to think, well, actually, we all need a very high level of individual design and individualization if we're going to get the most out of the training we do. Uh, and it's certainly, I have a big interest in coordination, and, and that was certainly probably spurred by that time with Paralympic athletes. Uh, and because it was it was never just strength deficits it was always there's a movement deficit as well and and that's the same with us in able-bodied sport yeah it's not some it's not just strength it's never just strength it's all well how do i fit this into a coordinated movement pattern that accomplishes accomplishes the task i want to accomplish proficiently and safely without me breaking down cool i mean coordination's become a bit of a um kind of a bit of buzzword at the minute but what what do you what do you mean by by coordination uh in, in them in them kind of terms that you're talking about well so i guess when you ask what is coordination we all have this very simple notion in our head yeah. well it's you know jump up and shake your bits and, <laughs> and and that's how you how you coordinate uh so on one level there's that very superficial definition on the other level there's very what i think of as esoteric pretty useless academic definitions. You know, the ability to master redundant degrees of freedom. Okay, great, that might be a definition of coordination, but it doesn't tell me what to do on the gym floor, or on the track or in the gym, you know, in the, in, in the warm up area. So for me, coordination is really how we embed movement habits. Um, and we tend to embed those based on a trade off between how much does this movement cost? How safe is this movement? How comfortable I am doing this movement? What's the cognitive load that's imposed by doing this movement? In other words, do I have to concentrate really hard to do this movement or can I do it a different way, more cheaply from a point of view of um, cognitive processes? So you put all those together and you practice for a long time and all of those then shape your coordination habits. But in a very basic way, for me, coordination is how can I move to get the job done for the least energy cost, for the least exposure to risk? Yeah, there's, there's been a bit of, um, again, obviously, Franz Bosch brought his new book out. Not that I've read it. I think, I'm, I, think I need a bigger brain to, to, um, to dilute all that. But has is, is that been a... Um, an influence, has he been an influence of yours in, in regards to that kind of, uh, that kind of discussion? Well, I guess bizarrely, we, we, you know, we've had quite a bit of contact. I brought him over to the UK in maybe 2006, pretty early days, just after he brought out his Running by Mechanics book. And uh, we've, you know, periodic contact and we both work very much in the coordination field. I think that he has done a great job in terms of he's introduced the topic to a broader world and he's brought a level of insight into it. I, I tend to have a slightly different take. Um, for example, Franz maybe de-emphasized the role of, of more normal, what we would consider more conventional strength training. I think there's an error there and we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater quite a bit. Uh, I would also tend to use uh, training modalities to enhance things like stability. I know these might be very slow moving movements and again, something that we don't convention do, but and certainly with Franz's work, he tends to work on more faster movements. But I would do a lot of non-specific movements, and a lot of them would be slow, and they'd be slow for a reason to work, to work reflexes, uh, stabilization reflexes, to to work uh, small stabilizing mu muscles, specifically around you know hip, knee, and so on. So yeah, there's differences, but I I am an admirer of his work. Cool. I mean, just just moving on a little bit. Um, I think you're probably uh, probably most well known for your for your views on periodization. So I just want to touch on on that side of things and maybe just get into a little bit of background on how that became a a kind of topic of interest for you um, and a bit more, maybe a bit of a background and actually your your views on on what we kind of traditionally get taught as periodization. Yeah. So I guess it it started. You know, when I was training myself freely and like 
so many others just trying to find a way to do things differently or to do things slightly better. And so when I was, you know, long before I ever went to, to university, I digested all the old Soviet literature, which was very much dogma at the time, you know, and no one really had a voice in periodization unless they had a foreign sounding, you know, Eastern U European name. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and, and I guess eventually, you know, there, there was just too many cracks appearing f f for me and I kind of obsessed about it quite a while. I, pr I probably stalked a few people around Europe for a while, um, going to presentations and, you know, catching them afterwards and arguing w with them. Um, so, yeah, basically, to the conclusion, maybe around 2000, 2001, that this is kind of the emperor's new clothes here. There's, we've set up this belief system and, and I break, segregate into individual blocks and time frame of those blocks and then say, yeah, this is the model of periodization that we work best for this actually. And, and I guess with my nerdy hat on, when you go back at the justification that the early periodization theor theorists were giving for what they were suggesting, it just couldn't hold substance. There's about four periodization theorists, all well known, who all favoured four week uh, phases, and all of them had completely different rationales to justify them. And none of them were scientific. They were just very random, you know, to to co to co to correspond with bio monthly cycles, for example. Well, what does that mean? Well, in contemporary academic terms, that means nothing. There is no bio-monthly cycle, really. There's multiple cycles going on all the time of completely different lengths. Why pick one and not pick the others? So, so that type of thing was pervasive. And it for me, it was, it was the emperor's new clothes. It was like, this is a great story. Let's not rock the boat. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, so how was that? How, how was that? How was that thought progressed um, into actually? kind of creating some sort of um, kind of formula to how you would then in the future go about periodizing for people? Yeah, well, so I guess it went through a few phases. First, it was total confusion. And that's me, you know, banging my head off a wall for maybe three or four years thinking, okay, I can see that this really is a, this is something that we want to be true, but there's actually no evidence to suggest it's, through, in other words, if I'm planning for an athlete, I can say, well, I'm going to adopt this old Russian's philosophy and I'm going to go use his period of periodization and that will work in my context. And, you know, that's what we did. And I just said, well, I just thought to myself, well, that, there's no way that that's true. There's just absolutely no way that that theory, which is pretty much bogus and made up effectively a fairy tale, is going to work for this athlete. So, but what do you do instead? And if you look deeply into the all the different things that conspire to make the training effect that you get completely different from the training effect that I get, if we both do the same training session, well, it just doesn't make sense that one routine could do it for everybody. It makes no sense. It all, all depends on your genetics, your epigenetics, uh, your epigenetics, which is which which of those gene uh, net networks are switched on. So having genes is one thing, but then switching them on is a completely different thing. And that's normally set, you know, early life experiences and, and uh, history and so on. And then you move up that chain and you think, well, it's also dependent on my my training history. It's also dependent on strengths and weaknesses, vulnerabilities, prior injuries. And then on this very day, well, it's dependent on how tired I am. And then after four years, I start poking around and you find out, well, actually, my training, the training effects that I get from this training session today, a lot of them depend on what do I think will happen? What are my expectations for this session? And a lot depend on what type of mood did I walk in the door in? In other words, 
what was my emotional setting when I started out this training session? Now, that may sound really strange to some people, but if you think of it in this way, training adaptations are driven by a by chemical, physical, electrical, uh, mental changes that are brought about by the training session. Now, I say chemical there. Training stresses are overlaid on a certain brain chemistry that you have at the moment, which changes all the time, and a certain hormonal background in your body. So what are the circulating hormones in your body when you overlay that training stress? And training adaptation is totally dependent on, well, it's not just what training did you do, is what was the current state of your chemical environment when you overlaid that training? As an example, if I am if I am in emotional distress, if I am very stressed, then the chemical environment in my brain is going to be very different than if I'm relatively calm going into a training session. The, the chemical environment in your brain drives the hormonal in, environment. Hormonal environment obviously greatly influences how you adapt. So I'm really going the long way around saying that actually, yeah, of course, training variables are one aspect of what drives adaptation to training, but it's only one aspect. And we talk about it all the time. And periodization talks about it all the time. But never in a periodization paper have I ever come across anyone saying, well, it kind of depends on the athlete's beliefs. Does the athlete believe they will get better? Does the athlete understand why they will get better? Can the athlete draw a clear link between this training I do today and the, and the, and my dreams and ambitions as an athlete. Because if the athlete can't draw that link, or if I can't and you can, then I would suggest that you will get better training outcomes, even if we do empirically the exact same physical actions. Uh, and just to, to clarify on the, the emotional bits I was talking about. So for me, what that looks like in real life, for me, that, that realization is, well, actually, if an athlete comes, and they're, they're having a hard time, relationship trouble, um, exam trouble is a great example, injuries a spike around exam time for university athletes. Um, I would adapt training slightly, or if not adapt training, I would certainly adapt their warm up. I might even give them a space before they come or before they start their warm up where the athlete decompresses. And this could be just going from an agitated, anxious state to, okay, you need to mellow out here. Get your breathing under control. You need to relax. You need to clear your head. You need to remind yourself about why you're here. You need to zoom into the goals of today, yada, yada, yada. So it's nearly uh, uh, a, and I think of it as a set to zero. You don't come in and then just do your warm up. You come in and if you're agitated, you get rid of that feeling. You remind yourself of why you're here. You block out everything else. And effectively what you're doing by going through that process is you're resetting the chemical environment. And that's the chemical environment that is going to interact with the training stress you're now going to overlay in it to regulate the initial adaptive response that drives whether you get benefit or not from this training session. So again, I'm going the long way around saying that none of this, we, we, we never ever learned about this in, in periodization school. Uh, this didn't really exist. And for me, that was just an example of, well, actually, w we talk about periodization and planning as if it's it's the main driver of the training of the adaptive process. It, this is what will get you into shape. But really, it's not. It's only one strand of a, a broader process that, and I don't think it helped us to just talk about physical training and how you plan it because it's it's kind of meaningless you can give me a training program that is agreed by the best coaches in the world but if i don't really understand why i'm doing it or what it's supposed to do or the intensity i'm supposed to feel uh, the effort i'm supposed to give to it then i would so if i don't have faith in that fantastic program i would much rather that the athlete was doing a run-of-the-mill program but had faith in it, trusted the coaches, bought into the program.
uh, knew exactly where their effort was to be distributed, when to push hard, when not to push hard, had been educated a little bit about, you know what, it's not just about the physical training. You need to you need to control what you're thinking so that controls your emotion. You need to be disciplined around a, a broad range of things around this training program. It is never just execute your your 10 sets of 400 on 90 seconds or your three sets of 12 of at 60 percent in a sense that's meaningless it's well sorry it's not meaningless it's a guideline but in the absence of other guidelines if we're not controlling the other variables then we're not really controlling or we're not controlling as much as we can the training response the adaptive response that ultimately is going to lead to the athlete being in the physical shape to achieve their goals or not so I've, I've, I've just written down here, John, planning, question mark. <clears throat> so how do we as coaches go about planning things in advance when there's so much kind of variation on the day? Yeah, and, and that's something that I, I struggled with for years. It was like in my head I could I could deconstruct why we shouldn't have this traditional periodization model but yet I, I didn't really have a solution. But but I guess over time we started to think, well, okay, we need a plan. We have to have a plan. If we don't have a plan, it's it's just chaos, right? It's it's turn up and meet and then decide what you're going to do. And you can't have that. So you have a plan. And you make that plan as logical and sensible as possible. Critically though, what I what I would do is I wouldn't necessarily buy into any of the off-the-shelf periodization uh, templates. Uh, what I would do is say, okay, this is this athlete. This is the way they've trained before. This is where we are now. This is where we need to go. And I'd construct the training plan from, from first principles, if you'd like. What are the main things they need to do? What are the, uh, the nice to-dos? What are the potential add-ons? All of that. And I would plan it out, not using somebody else's template i plan it out in terms of how do i best set down a structure that will make sense to this athlete and will move this athlete forward now i guess there's, there's a, a key thing here um certainly from a research perspective despite what a lot of periodization theorists say there is no evidence that one type of periodization is better than another type of periodization it is it all depends who you are what's the athlete what measures you take were they trained or untrained yada 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 so there's no evidence that one is better than the other obviously people who design experiments they interpret it the way they want and it's very easily it's very easy to prove any method of variation uh, is is better than no variation uh, even though in some studies no variation has worked just as well and but a lot depends on the level of the athlete and how long you run the study for so basically the main point i'm getting to there is there isn't really any evidence to say one is better than the other even though people do interpret things that way um, and for me all of these training questions come down to if you're going to do it right you have to negotiate a balance so if you want the athlete to improve there needs to be consistency they need to have key aspects of training, be it key training sessions that they are very familiar with and they execute on a regular basis. Now, these will be mainstays of your program and it will obviously depend on your sport, um, but you have mainstays of, of, of your program, consistent things that you as a coach think, I know that this works. This is what we build on and they're consistent and they're in there. I think then there's kind of a paradox going on here. You need that consistency. But if you want improvement, improvement normally takes some degree of change. So you have those two things in your head and then you have something else that we all need to be aware of. Injuries, illnesses, always spike if change is introduced too quickly. So all of a sudden we have this trade off. Well, well I need some change to keep driving adaptation, but I need to introduce that change in a subtle way. And so to get back to your, your question about, okay, but what does that actually look like? And what I would suggest is that there are elements there that are consistent. 
and there are elements there that change on a, a regular basis, but that that change is managed and monitored if possible. So it's not dramatic change, because dramatic change, you might get quick spikes in, in performance, but you're taking a huge risk. Um, so yeah, what I'm giving you isn't really a clear answer, do, do X or do Y. But what I am saying is as coaches, we need to wrestle with that and we need to say, well, okay, I know I need some consistency, but I also need to balance that with change. And there's benefits from change, but I need to be aware of the risks of change as well. And I think a lot of this, from a coach's perspective, isn't about having rules or laws. It's about having understanding and then applying that understanding to the individual uh, circumstance of the particular athlete or the, or the, the squad or the team or whatever it may be. So with so many, so much possibility for variation on day to day, obviously you've, you've touched on how you'd go about that with, with individual, are you, you touched on the kind of individual side of the, of the kind of strength and conditioning with whether you're working with a swimmer or a, from someone from track and field, but how does that, how does that translate into team sports when you've got kind of 18 lads who have got, so so many different states that they could turn up in how does how does your thinking kind of translate to that type of scenario well i think a lot of it depends on context mm -hmm. so for example if i am if i'm a coach working in a university with four athletes there's no way that i can individualize fully so but what i do is i'm just aware of I'm aware of in, in, individual uh, variability. Uh, when what I can do is maybe educate the athletes. So, okay, there's 40 of you here. I, there's no way I can individualize based on day-to-day -day fluctuations. But here's what I am saying. Every day we're going to do, I don't know, uh, how I feel RP or something like that. Uh, it's important that if you have no confidence that you will be able to execute this high intensity session safely, you need to come to me and we'll talk. If not, then crack on. You know, so basically you, you can build in what, what ifs. Now, the awkward thing is the what ifs depend on the level of education of the athletes. What do the athletes understand? Do they think I have to grind out a session no matter what? Or do they think, well, actually, me grinding out this session here is foolhardy. And, and I think there's something, again, we don't normally talk, but I think there's a there's a, a burden on the coach to educate the athlete so the, so the athletes know when, you know what, maybe this isn't a good decision. Maybe I need to talk to the coach. Uh, so I think the best way to do it in that context is rather than the coach try and micromanage everything, it's like empower the athletes. And we, we were always afraid to do that because we think the athletes will be lazy in some way. But that's not my experience. I think, you know, things are framed right and athletes aren't inherently lazy. Nobody wants to be shoddy. Nobody is interested in, oh, I aspire to be a subpar athlete. They all want to be as good as they can. But I think it's just a case of us giving them the education, giving them the knowledge, leaving them know, you know what, these are the what ifs, come and talk to me. Now, Going back to the scenario of it's you with 40 athletes in a university setting, you could set up that structure in a, in a meeting or two and say to the athletes, you know, we, we, we can't micromanage everyone, but here's what we want you to do. Sometimes you really do need to grind out sessions, even if you're feeling good. This isn't about taking the easy way out, but if you're feeling really bad, then we need to talk and we need to maybe look at why that is or we need to tr change your warm-up, or, or we need to change your sleep habits, or we need to change your diet, or, or, or. Um, and I guess that that's really the job, right? It's not just us putting down a program and then rocking up with our stopwatch and, and our whistle and expecting everyone to perform well. It's it's Sometimes it has to be a little bit touchy-feely if, if we want to get the, the most out of the people we work with. So just going back to the kind of physical type, physical type side of things. So when, when um, obviously there's all this variation uh, in regards to kind of emotional state and hormonal and things, but when it comes to the physical, how are you 
monitoring your athletes when they they come to see you on a morning what kind of what kind of protocols do you have in place to see where they lie physically uh well again that's that that's dependent on context so if um so most professional sport team sports now will have a a, ba a battery of tests that will be executed either daily or two three four times weekly uh and you know obviously that varies organization to organization but normally there's maybe a couple of physical tests and they could be as simple as a groin squeeze uh they might be something where it's if you're getting a little fancier it could be something like reaction time uh, it could be you know the standard you do a counter movement jump there's normally some kind of sleep questionnaire but there's there's quite a few to choose from and, and most professional teams would have a battery of tests that people would execute first thing in the morning or when they get to the training ground and then again you know going through something like kitman or, or whoever it might be you would look at outliers is there drastic deviations is this something i need to be looking at is a player very obviously tired and do we need to adapt so basically what you're looking at there is an alert system so in a team sport that works okay but the truth of it is there isn't really any perfect tests that tell you this person will 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 uh injure themselves if they go out and and and, and play in this current state um so all it does is give you hints but if you see drastic deviation in a couple of scores, normally you can say, you know what, I need to take closer order with this athlete. We need to have a chat. Then you might find, no, you know what, I was just a bit stiff this morning. It, I loosened it out now, I feel fine. Or, yeah, you know, I've been feeling really bad. That was a really hard match at the weekend. I haven't slept right. And then you might think, okay, maybe we need to adapt. Um, if we move towards an individual level, uh, my approach would be one of two things if it was a young athlete so a young elite then we might introduce some of those empirical tests not because you ever have complete faith in them but because it gets the athlete into a process and a way of thinking a way of tuning into okay how do i feel today um and, and i've tried like lots of these everything from you know little laptop based reaction time tests to jump tests to drop jumps, you know, all kinds of everything. And you never really find anything that is really accurate, you know, that, that is always right, that, that always nails it on the head. We just haven't come across that. Except perhaps the oldest and easiest of them all, which is just you give me a personal rating of how you feel at the moment, an RPE of how you feel of how you slept and, and even though that is in, especially in this day and age that is a ridiculously non-technological non-fancy you don't need to an app for your iphone to do it but the more it's looked at you know you just it just keeps coming back to perhaps the best tool we have is an educated athlete a switched on athlete a motivated athlete who can dial into their own feelings and then communicate clearly back to the coach where they're where exactly where they're feeling and, and that would involve the coach and the athlete having a, a shared term terminology so if the athlete says to me yeah you know what i'm a six out of ten that i'm not thinking six out of ten that's a disaster whereas in, in the athlete's head is that's normal so th so there's a shared terminology and then if there's a deviation the coach is aware of it and just just to explain none of these things i'm suggesting are a way out of training there shouldn't be a way out of training it's just a way of maybe flagging information to the coach to suggest there's been a little change here i just need a short conversation or a long conversation or whatever it is but i just need to take closer order with the athlete and we'll make a decision and we'll push on as planned or if necessary we'll adapt and it's all the subtle <coughs> excuse me small dis decisions that over time, over the course of a training program, over the course of a season of an athletic career, make all, I think, make all the difference in in terms of athlete getting the most bang for their buck from their training and the athlete staying healthy. So, so you mentioned uh, Kitman Labs there. 
I mean, I know we've we've spoke a little bit about it previously, but uh, it's obviously there's, there's been plenty of publicity um, with its with its use in a couple of Premier League clubs. But and I might maybe going over all ground for you, but a lot many people might not have heard of it. Do you just want to give us a little bit of an insight into how they they manage um, what they do in in Irish rugby? Uh, yeah, well, I think without. Give I'm, much away, it's safe to I'm, say not, that, I'm not getting commission or anything, by the way. So it's, uh, <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> well, um, so what Kitman would do is there would be a range of monitoring te tests uh, and that the players would execute two or three times a week. Now, in Kitman, there would be previous scores for that athlete. So, and there would, there would be a normal range. And I guess what you would look for then is, is there deviation from the normal range in one or more of these daily measures? And these measures can be really simple. They could be as simple as a sit and reach, groin squeezes, as I mentioned, or they could be as complicated as, as some laptop-based complex reaction time test. Uh, and really, again, what, what you're looking for is just, are a couple of things deviating and do I need to take closer order with the athlete? Uh, and that's where I'd see the use of of that type of of um, tool as as a flag, mostly just to inspire a conversation. You can't go and have conversations with forty different people every morning, but you can if three or four are flagged up. And it's probably it, well, it's definitely worthwhile to check out. Well, why exactly is there a change there, and do I need to do something about it, or is it okay? Just, I've just got one more thing to ask you. Just going back, probably right to the start where we where we um, we kicked off with regards to the um, emotional state. So, athlete comes into the gym. Well, how, apart from obviously the obvious conversation and maybe RP, like you say a, a wellness RP or wellness scores or something. How are you? Is there any other way that you're able to monitor that emotional state of that player? Oh, is the is the RPE the kind of the one that you that you go to? I would think that perhaps the best way to do it is that, and again, this comes to context and it comes down to the level of experience and education of the athlete. And when I say education, I mean it doesn't matter how good they are in school; it's how you know their 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 training education and their education in relation to how how do I feel? <laughs> do I think about how I feel? Do I maybe monitor or track how I feel? Uh, do I tune into my sleep? Am I aware that my sleep habits might be very erratic or irregular? And so that's the type of education I'm talking about. And that's something that I think the coach should look at gradually over time as the as they educate the athlete into the kind of the, the intricacies of the whole performance construct that perhaps the athlete gives better feedback better feedback to the coach is more powerful information make, means the coach can help make better decisions or can make better decisions so from that perspective information is power but we again we rarely spend time trying to nurture the information that the athletes give back to us and say to the athletes well you know this the type of information is really useful to me as, a, as the coach decision maker so you need to think about how you're communicating that to me. And you know, to have some type of simple little tool, like it might be you have a weekly debrief or a monthly debrief, or you know, there's the some degree of, we're going to take care of this communication process. Even if we're arguing, even if I'm pissed off at you or vice versa, we still have, you know what, we still have our Friday meeting and this is what we do. We sit down, we talk about the week, we talk about how you're feeling, yada, yada, yada. Just an example of um, of a, a process. Getting back to your question, it could be something as simple as, again, let's say you're in an impossible position to individualize. You're working with 40 athletes, really busy, tight time frames, lot to do. Perhaps it could be as simple as, you know, I want you all to, the first three minutes of the session, let's just stay quiet. I have written up on the flip chart here are the objectives for the session. Here are the key things for you to think about, you know, uh, while you're moving through this session. I just want you to first quieten down, get your thoughts together, maybe have a think about 
what type of athlete you want to be in the future, what you want to be remembered for. Then have a think about how does this session help you achieve those goals? How does this session make you a better athlete than you are now? And then once you've kind of manipulated that, once you've got them to, okay, I've calmed down, I might've been rushing through traffic to get here, I might've had a, you know, an argument with my partner, yada, yada, yada. What you're doing is you're getting them to clear out all that debris. You're getting them just to mellow out a little bit. You're getting them to focus on what's going to be important for the next hour, hour and a half. Uh, you're getting them to realize, well, actually, you know, this is really important. I'm, this isn't just a session to clock up. You know, this is an experience I have to live. I have to get the most out of it. So you're kind of, you're refocusing them and then you have a warm up. And obviously the warm up is never just physical, right? The warm up is always, you know, I need to get myself into the right emotional state. Is this a very hard session that I'm have to, have, going to have to go into pretty aggressive and hard? Or is this a more technical session where I need to be really calm and really dialed into uh, sensory feedback, for example? So I guess what I'm suggesting is that for me, and I've done this with plenty of athletes, there's a, a reset to zero phase, which is the first phase, which is just mellow out here. Now, now that you're calm, now let's get our th thinking hat on. Remember who you are and why you're here and who you want to be and, and how this is going to help you get to where you want to be. And now we need to get your head, your emotions, your focus. We get need to get that into the right zone so that you can extract the most worth from this training program. Uh, and again, if you think of it like that, it's it's a lot more than we normally consider the warm-up process to be or the pre-training routine to be. But again, for my money, and yeah, yes, it is a, a, an opinion, but I've based that opinion on much as much as possible on on what we know about training adaptation or what we think we know about training a, adaptation. So it might be wrong, but at least it's a well thought through wrong. Cool. Well, that's been uh, that's been really interesting. I'm just I'm just conscious of time again. Um, Absolutely. But, but where where can people keep up to date with what you've got going on? I know you're very active on on Twitter, putting lots of kind of a big variation of information out there from from what you read. So where can people keep up to date with what you've got going on? Uh, well, I guess I, I got I talked into starting on Twitter a couple couple of years ago by an athlete friend of mine and. Uh, I'm not on it that often these days, a couple of times a week, and I tend to just brain dump anything interesting I've read over the week or things in my head onto it. So, yeah, I mean, if, if people are interested, uh, it'd be great to have your, your company. So I'm at, uh, at Simply Sports. So I, other than that, uh, I I don't know what there is really to keep up with. I, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm work, I'm busy. Uh, <laughs> uh, people can contact me if they want. I mean, I'm more than happy to talk to people uh, on Skype or e email. My email is jakekiley at uclan.ac.uk. Uh, so I'd be happy to hear from people if they have questions, comments or feedback. Cool. Well, I'll round up there and just say thank you very much for your time. Uh, really appreciate your insight. Um, it was it was very, very interesting. So I've gained a lot from it as well. So really appreciate it. And I'll um, we'll keep in touch. Thanks a million, Rob. Pleasure. Okay, pal. Thank you. See you later. Thanks for tuning in to episode 69 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So massive thanks to Vald Performance, makers of the Nord Board, for sponsoring the episode today. So just before I let you go, I'm just going to remind you of Pacey Performance webinar series number three, coming up on the 21st of February with Matt Jordan. So Matt will be talking everything from monitoring, to detecting asymmetries and fatigue. So it'll be a great uh, presentation by Matt. So if you are interested, get to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Matt. So thanks again for tuning to episode 69 and I will see you in episode 70. <laughs>